Hey, good evening, everyone. How are you? Uh, welcome to the first ever Data Caller webinar to be hosted here in the Philippines. Um, I'm Joe Avila, and uh, with me is Jade Spatanke. Uh, I'm a professional photographer. I'm one of the Canon Blue Series of Light for Canon Marketing Philippines. Uh, Jay was my student when he was in college. <laughs> yeah, Jay. And Jay right now would have to say age check. Age check. <laughs> uh, Jay's a professional photographer. He's also a fellow Canon Procedure of Light. And uh, Jay would sh uh, now shoots for some of the top 100 uh, companies in the Philippines, among them Coca Cola. Nestle and John B. Um, okay, now it is. Uh, Jay and I, we both calibrate our monitors. Why? It's important for us. See, the computer monitor is your preview of the digital file. So you want it to be accurate. <coughs> if your monitor is calibrated, it allows you to have a closer match between the screen and the print. And you save time, money, and effort. Uh, why? Uh, you hardly waste anything. Uh, normally, G would work on his files in his studio, and he comes to me. And, well, he used to have his prints done by me, but he recently got his own Canon Pixma Pro 1, so I doubt I'll drop my description. I will, I, I will still, don't worry. <laughs> okay, and because Jay, Jay calibrates his monitor, when it comes to me, all I have to do is just do a final check and print his images. Uh, he has the color profiles for all of my printers. So when the prints come out, uh, they're always a close match to his screen. And uh, well, as you can see, Jay is more than happy with the results. Now, I got a quick question for everyone. Um, how many of you actually calibrate your monitor? Uh, could you just have a quick show, quick show please? OK. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have people who are few. Uh, yes, yes, come on. Come on, a few more votes, few more votes, guys. Let's see now. Uh -huh. Yes, come on. We're waiting for a few more votes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and let's look at the votes. I'm going to close the poll and let's see what happened. Okay, and these are our results. Okay, so, oops, sorry. It seems that 47% well, mm -hmm, of you do calibrate your monitors and about 53 don't. Okay, uh, right now, Okay, I'm going to give the control over to Jay, and he's going to start his talk. Okay, hold it. Okay, Jay, all yours. Okay. Uh, good evening, guys. So this is uh, this is a photography talk about cosplay. Again, I am uh, Jay Tablante, and I'm one of the Canon brand ambassadors, also known as the Crusaders of Light, along with uh, Sir Joe. H-check. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, a quick run-through. So uh, get on with the program. So we're going to go through some history of cosplay. What's the difference between East and the West, uh, if there is such a cultural divide? And we're going to go through an idea called imagining. And of course, uh, the types of cosplay, the flavors of cosplay. Um, we're going to see some of our work portfolio. 
and the usual Q&A at the end of this presentation. <coughs> so, what is cosplay? Okay. From a visual standpoint, cosplaying is nothing new. It is basically a person in a costume. It is a form of performing arts. And it is connected to a particular character design. So in this context, mimes, clowns, jesters are the predecessors to what you call the modern day cosplayers. Okay. Hold on, let's wait for until all people get to see the screen. <coughs> All right. A little bit of history. Funny thing is, cosplay did not start in Japan, much to what um, much to common knowledge for a lot of people. There is no formal timeline or accurate setting when the movement began, except for the first documented cosplayer, modern day cos. Uh, modern-day cosplayer during the first World Science Fiction Convention, or also known as the World Con, in the 1930s. And so the fall, the, you know, over the internet, a lot, over the internet, a lot of the details have been modeled about the history, but more or less, a lot of people have, um, have this consensus that Forrest J. Ackerman happens to be the first cosplayer, or the father of modern-day cosplay. <clears throat> And it was in the 1980s when this writer named Nov Takahashi coined the word cosplay during his visit to the Worldcon in Los Angeles in the, in the mid-80s. Now, why would I say mid-80s? Because there's a dispute between which year he actually attended. Some would say 1985, some would say 1984. But, you know, with a little bit of research, it's, it, they say he went there in 1984. But let's keep it in the mid-80s just, uh, just to be sure. <coughs> So East versus West cosplay. So what is it? What's the difference, if there's any? Why, you know, I would have to point out, why particularly Japan and the U.S.? Why, why single out these two countries? Both countries eventually became global influencers in pop culture. So if you notice, most of our movies, uh, most of our movies, comics, and anime would come from either one. Or um, as, as, it, as in the scene here in the Philippines, we... Most of us are influenced by either one in what we see in pop culture. <clears throat> Second, they have a solid creators industry, meaning a good number of the companies are found there, the ones who produce a lot of these content. So you have um, Walt Disney, to uh, Toy Animation, what, uh, Marvel, DC, they're all found in either one. And they both serve the local consumers market in, uh, with, with respect to their own countries and beyond. More often than uh, more often than not, sorry for the typo. The rest of the world consume the pop culture they produce. Now, if there's such a okay, hold on. Let's wait until everybody sees. Okay. What is uh, I wouldn't say divide, but what's the difference between the scenes in the U.S. and in Japan? Most of the cosplay in the U.S. happens during uh, conventions. So you have people, you know, having day jobs, having normal lives and all, who would come into costume on the weekend when there, when there is a convention happening. <clears throat> but a stark difference here is Japan's cosplay scene ended up growing leaps and bounds simply because every Sunday in, peep, in places like Harajuku, in the Harajuku district, uh, is already a small con. So these are, if you can see the pictures, that's, you know, people already come in costume, teens comes, uh, come in costume, you know, from the, uh, the moment you get down from the Harajuku station, the, the bridge near going the, near the Meiji Jingu Shrine up until the road, you know, where you'd buy all these shops, you would see all, all teens and people, you know, dressing up. And for one, manga and anime 
are part of their mainstream, catering to a more adult audience. Okay, and it's also uh, it's also curious to point out that cost the the demographics with cosplayers between well not as, not just in Japan but also in the U.S. You have a younger audience. You have, you have a younger set of cosplayers in Asia compared to those in the U.S. Um, you'd also notice that um, cosplayers in the U.S. tend to be is have have a broader range between teens up until beyond their 30s. There are still people who come in costume simply because they like it. Whereas in Asia, I wouldn't say I wouldn't exactly say expiry date, but um, most cosplayers here, you know. Tend to tend to go to other things after 25. So, but that, that's the local average. <clears throat> now, with with just okay, emerging trends. Now, with cosplaying growing in the scene, there are a lot of um, alterations and artistic ex uh, expressions. You know, going beyond the norm of just dressing up. So there is what you call Crossplay, okay. The gender rules are bent and reversed against the archetype. The word archetype, we will uh, go over that in length in the next section. So, what do we have here? If you look at the visual, you have characters that are reversed. All right. There's, uh, of course, there are female versions of such character, but if you notice, there is a female Batman. There is a male Wonder Woman. That's that's uh, that's pretty, that's a bit weird, in a male sorry in a female Superman. It's not Supergirl, it's not Power Girl, but the costume design is Superman, except that a woman is wearing it. Okay, so it's the gender roles are bent on this one. <clears throat> and then there are what you call character mashups. So these are several archetypes or several character designs that have been put together. So you could see a Stormtrooper Mario. And as you could see, uh, there's a Chun Li, Hello Kitty Chun Li, which is actually a uh, an, an official a merch, uh, licensed product between Sanrio and Capcom. I've seen it myself during the San Diego Comic Con. I wanted to buy the plush toy, but you know they quickly ran they quickly run out. Okay. Now again, it's a combination of several character designs into one. <clears throat> Okay, now cosplay photography. Finally, you know what's the you know what's this brouhaha uh, all about? Okay, let's click. Let's wait till people see it. Okay, now we're gonna go through a basic framework um, of how we can approach this entire new subgenre. Okay, again, it's a subgenre versus other established forms such as landscape and fashion, um, still life, uh, artistic nudes, whatever. It can be said that it's a subgenre of fashion photography. Why? Fashion photography defined by an emphasis on clothes and where the image is situated. Character designs are unique to a wardrobe which is then made live to a natural person. But, you know, I would... Um, I would further add to this that cosplay photography is a mishmash of a lot of things now. So you could say there's fashion photography, there's portraiture in it, there's some landscape involved because we're all about creating a scene for a character and you know shooting beyond a person in a costume. <clears throat> okay, and the common denominator is distinction through wardrobes. Hence, you know, uh, we could say that a good number of rules of fashion photography will apply to cosplay because wardrobe is particularly one of the defining elements in a uh, cosplay shoot. Okay, so what's the photography scene here? Okay, The rise of modern day cosplay photography is roughly 25 years old, coincidentally aligned with the development of digital cameras. It began as documenting cosplayers in conventions. So you know, it's just, it started out as you know people would just visit conventions and take pictures of the cosplayers who are you know uh, cost stripping, as they would say, and they would just you know parade in their costumes. <clears throat> but then, as the years gone by, we've seen an evolution to more structured sets, similar similar to 
editorial and fashion, even glamour shoots. Okay, and it's good to know. It's it's uh, curious to note that the popularity has grown bigger through social media and the internet because pop culture, this all this geekery, it's all you know all tied to it, and it's naturally tech savvy. So geeks being geeks, we are you know well I'm a self-confessed geek. It's all connected to technology. So the rise of digital camera, social media, and all gave a lot of proliferation to cosplayers, costly photographers, prop makers, and what have you within the industry. Okay. You can't just be the photographer. You have to immerse yourself into the genre to maximize the potentials of an image. So this is when I, you know, being a self-confessed geek and you know producing all these images, <clears throat> uh, I started going beyond uh, just taking pictures or just being the man clicking the shots and letting the cosplayer be or whatever. I want to learn more. So that was the geek inside me. It's it's that insatiable hunger to learn, and that's how you know I started digressing into other things aside from just photography. In you know in in relation to cosplay photography. So first things first. Um, what are archetypes? Okay, this is one of the key uh, key factors or the key words I started uh, researching on when, when you know going through this entire thing about cosplay photography. What are archetypes? Okay. Archetypes as the original model from which copies are derived from and universally accepted by all. Okay, it sounds a little bit a motherhood statement here, okay? But uh it's a design. Okay, it is designed for a particular character. It is established by an individual or a group of people. So there are some uh, create there are co-creators and there can be just one creator to create <clears throat> to make a particular character. Okay. Now, archetypes and uh, archetypes and cosplay. From a visual standpoint, some open-ended question. What's the difference between a character like Joker versus a regular circus clown? Okay. Now, um, this is a, this is an open-ended question. Anybody can answer if they can, uh, <laughs> you know, say something in the que in the uh, question section or whatever. But the main difference here is that known characters are brands. Okay. Joker is basically created by Bill Finger, Bob Kane, and Jerry Robinson. The first, the first appearance would be in Batman number one in 1940. So you know, Joker and a regular circus clown are practically the same, except for that the, these three people packaged Joker as a clown being somebody wearing a cheap purple suit, green hair white foundation, corsage, a big crazy smile, and whatever. So we automatically know that some a clown wearing all of these uh, attributes is linked to Joker. So a clown wearing this, this, that, doing this, this, that is equal to the Joker. All right. So these three people established the fact that Joker will look like this. And anybody else, any other clown wearing another thing is not the Joker. So what happens here is that we have creators basically summing up attributes for their particular character and serve to the public to be accepted as fact. Okay, so we have these creators creating all these characters and we're saying that he has a cape, he flies, has super strength, has heat ray vision and all that. Package them together, he is Superman, something like that.
Okay. There is an interesting question here. Um, if brands, uh, if they are brands, why is that some characters wear a different costume? All right, I'll, I'm get, I'm gonna get there. And here's one solid example. Okay. Okay, let's wait for all three to load. Now, how do you know Batman is Batman? All right. Uh, you could see the cowl, the the utility belt, the cape, the bat, uh, the bat logo. So if you notice, there are three different renditions of Batman from different artists, even Adam West portraying the classic old Batman. But then these are totally different looking Batmans and could be wearing different costumes. But then there are significant elements within them that would still retain the branding of Batman, right? So, you know, the moment you see the pointy ears, the cape and all, no matter how, whether he was wearing a black suit, uh, a blue suit or whatever, you would know it is Batman. Because there are certain um, archetype elements that will always be consistent despite the changes in costume. <clears throat> now, archetypes are established and exist depending on time, geographic exposure, and public acceptance. So what, what am I saying here? Is that we are not exposed to the same um, set of characters. So I, as, as I would say to Sergio, it's an age check. So some of us might be familiar with Voltes V, uh, Mazinger Z. Some may be familiar to Gundam, Robotech, uh, the X-Men. So you know, depending on where you live, when, you, when your youth is, or how exposed you are to uh, pop culture, the, uh, certain characters will be exposed and not exposed to you. Okay? And yes, uh, anime is uh, also, a f uh, anime characters are also archetypes, all right? Uh, specific designs like uh, Dragon Ball Z, Son Goku, uh, Vegeta, uh, even Lin Min Mei. Who, yeah, you know, whether or not they're comic book characters or anime characters, it's still a character. So they are still considered as archetypes. Okay. <clears throat> now, our ever-evolving pop culture rests on the characters we are exposed to and the strength of their recall. So, like I said, there are characters that we tend to remember and tend to forget. Okay, and depending how popular they are. Um, somebody asked, uh, character uh, brand equals costume packaging? Yes and no. Because... Uh, Yes, the costumes can change, but as long as the main elements are there, that's the, that's the thing that's going to be consistent. Okay? Now, in the next slide, the more influential the character, the less attributes needed to remind us. Okay? So the more famous the character is, uh, the less attribute is needed for us to remember who it or he, she is. Okay? And that's a good... And this next... Visual is a very good example. He, I would say a he, um, is such an it's such an influence to a lot of uh, children and even adults. Is that all we need to see are the silhouette of his ears and face, and we can immediately remember who he is. Unless you are living under a rock, this might be a Venn diagram. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> True enough, yes, it can be Minnie Mouse, but you know, it's the it's the same mouse. <laughs> Wait, Minnie Mouse has the ribbon on top to separate, you know, the genders. <laughs> okay. Imagination to reality. So this is where the part goes. Uh, you know, as a as a case of making it real, there are two sides to this. There is a, what you call your imagination versus public. Let's wait. For the load, your imagination versus public perception. So there is something in your head. It's your concept, all right. It's your idea, and public perception. Um, how people would see your work. And somewhere in between, somewhere that that you know that overlap is what you call the perfect concept when you when you communicate your idea properly to your audience. <clears throat> okay. Now. 
next slide. Let's wait for it to load, 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 load. As a newbie back then, into much frustration, you know, the pictures in my camera never looked the same way as I originally imagined. Okay, how did that happen? So, you know, when I was starting out, I had all these ideas in my head. Wow, I want to shoot an awesome concept. But the moment I'm already shooting it and taking, you know, clicking in front, there's the model, there's everybody there. I look at the screen and said, holy crap, how come it doesn't exactly look like what I wanted to shoot? So uh, that's been a frustration then. And it has, it, it has been, a, uh, not, I wouldn't exactly say lifelong search, but uh, it has been a search, um, uh, uh, it has been, a, it, it has been this uh, imagined, uh, creative search of mine, creative soul searching to solve that problem. The, di the gap, the difference between my imagination and the end result. And that's what you call uh, the interpretation gap. So, okay, so here's an idea. Like, can anybody guess who's this? All right. Sailor Jupiter, thank you. <laughs> Somebody is a, a, a you know, who knows their Sailor Sailor Mar, a, a Sailor Moon character. Okay, so imagine, imagine you have Sailor Jupiter in your head. I want to shoot Sailor Jupiter. So what happens here? I shoot it, and then I ended up with this. <laughs> what you might end up, yeah, in front of your camera. <laughs> so, the the gap in between what's in your head. And the final result is what you call the interpretation gap. <laughs> okay? I just, you know, funny thing is the, the picture on the right, I surfed, uh, I surfed online and found all these guys wearing Sailor Moon outfits. <laughs> okay, anyway. There is something I would like to introduce to you guys uh, as, a, as a concept. Humans are meaning making machines. We subconsciously put meaning into things as part of our cognitive functions because we're, you know, we're naturally wired that way. We tend to want to understand it. Um, okay, so there's what you call your imagination to the audience at large. Uh, and then the failure to deliver that idea, what happens is people will tend to inject their own interpretation whenever your idea it doesn't make it and there's a gap that is uh, produced. Okay? So one solid example of what happened to me years ago when I started out uh, was I wanted to shoot this character named uh, B.B. Hood. I hope this uh, the image turns up. Okay, B.B. Hood. There is B.B. Hood. And then when I tried shooting it, here was my final result. So during the shoot, I had problems with the wig because I happened to leave the wig back home, and this was, you know, 45 minutes and an hour ways out of uh, Manila, and it's a hassle given the traffic. So I said, "Screw it, let's shoot it without the wig and post it nonetheless." Okay. So I posted it online, and I started getting a barrage of comments from cosplayers saying, "That's not BB Hood simply because she doesn't have a, you know, blonde hair." So in my mind, it is BB Hood, but for them it's not. So there's what you call that. There's the gap of interpretation that happens. Okay. So at the end of the day, what did I uh, learn out of this? Do not assume people think the same way as you. Look at your work from a third-person perspective, meaning you know I will. I won't look at myself. I won't look at my work as Jay, but as another photographer looking at you know and commenting on my work. And understanding the creative processes gives us the power to understand why we think in such a way. It's a self-reflection, uh, so to speak. How we look at ourselves and how we can uh, improve or be self-discerning in, in our methods. Okay, So I introduced the idea of imagineering. Okay, let's wait for this to load. Okay. So, imagineering 
is actually a word started by the Walt Disney Company as a job title. Um, it's uh, it started by the Walt Disney Company as a job title for the people who designed the theme park rides. All right. Oh, wait. Here's a nice question: Who or what defines a specific archetype? The creators do. They make it. So when they whenever they introduce the character, they will in, they will introduce the visuals and his or her or it. it it's um, attributes define the standard uh, archetype. Okay. So coming back, um, imagination plus imag uh, engineering is imagineering. So it's a it's a case of imagination plus creativity, technical skills to make it happen. And what happens here is you have a concept, you invoke imagineering tools, and you get your final image. Okay. So now, in a sense. I don't see myself as just the photographer, any. Uh, I don't see this, uh, myself as a photographer anymore, but a, an Imagineer collaborating with fellow Imagineers to realize an image. Hence, if you would see, I would, sh I would show later on in my um, uh, in my folio. Uh, I love working with lots of people because it's a collaborative thing. We are all creatives here. You know, I wouldn't say I'm a photographer, but I am an Imagineer using photographs to communicate, much the same way that illustrators, writers, musicians are all Imagineers. We are just using different mediums, but we are all producing creativity. Okay? So this is a team effort. So uh, as much as photographers are credited for the images, the same way as directors for films, everybody else contributes just as much in their craft. So a quick run through of the books, uh, I would actually read. Like I said, I'm a self-confessed geek, so you know, I would read a lot of books. The more I got engrossed with the creation of the image, the more I needed to have knowledge over its elements. So that's where it started. Uh, it wasn't enough for me to just be the photographer, but I was obsessive compulsive enough to learn how the other things were made. It's not because I wanted to do it myself, but I want to be able to communicate what's in my head into the lingo of my other teammates or other co-creators and you know, co-imagineers, as you'd say. So, you know, ironic for a photographer, I realized that photography is the last thing I was supposed to be studying. <laughs> funny, funny enough. First book that I would like to introduce uh, is a book on makeup. Okay. So this is by Kevin, the late Kevin Aqua, and uh, I I wanted to learn makeup because I wanted to say that you know how do you how because yeah you have a model in front of you I want to tell to the makeup artist uh, her nose is pretty flat give me a nose line you know uh, so she can have a bit of a sharper looking nose in the camera things like that so I wanted to speak the language of makeup so whenever I have an idea of what uh, in my head I can communicate in the language of the makeup artist. Okay. Now the next book is a book on fashion. It's a fa it's a fashion history um, from the 1950s up until uh, the year 2000. So it gives me an idea of what's the basic form and function of clothes, and right? what were the fashion trends in, and also considers the social and cultural context of such fashion trends. So why why was the A-line skirt this way? Why why, why was the balloon skirt uh, made this way? Um, and you know so on and so forth. The next book I would like to suggest is this. It's a very important book. It's called In Character, Char Actors Acting. So the, the, the author happens to be a Hollywood photographer and what he did is he got a lot of these actors playing different roles that are beyond their reach. So you'd see Don Cheadle, the guy who portrayed Rhodey in, uh, in Iron Man playing the role of a 16-year-old girl in a, bon, in a Bon Jovi concert, something like that. What's the takeaway here is that you know, you're know you not just a photographer, but you are a director. You have somebody in your head, and you have to communicate to the models what you want. What can be sexy for you is a different definition of sexy to the model. So you have to be precise. You have to be able to communicate up until to the tiny poses 
what you want to happen since it is your idea. Models are not mind readers, okay? <clears throat> the next book I would like to introduce, of course, is Cover Run because I am influenced a lot by comics. And this is, uh, you know, w one of the prolific artists for DC, Adam Hughes, okay? So these are like his work over DC over the years. And I just wanted to see how comic book artists um, render their composition. What is ana what is the human anatomy for them? And I, ge I guess translating it into photography gives that unique perspective. Because I like um, I like talking to artists because I want to pick in their heads. I want to see how these perceive reality and see how can we turn that into photography. Okay, now the last book. Uh, oh, do you have a sample for anime magazine? Uh, well, later once we go to the folio. Okay, now the other book is what you call Light Science in Magic. All right. This is, uh, I think this is the fourth edition. I think there's already the sixth edition that's color red. Uh, it doesn't talk about photography per se, but it talks about uh, the science of light against everyday things. It solves for lighting scenarios because it makes you understand how light bounces against wood, glass, metal, or how does uh, glare um, work. What's the family of angles that will produce a reflection, what have you. So how did this help me out is that I don't, need to memorize particular lighting formations anymore but what I need to see is the textures in an image so for example um, in, in some of our works I would actually stare into nothing you know I would stare into the scene or I would I would stare into the set my art my my production designer will make for me and then I would just imagine and see the textures and from there you know this book's takeaway is that it helped me imagine how will light bounce in a particular manner in that scene. So even before clicking the camera, I get to see or you get to imagine how it looks like, more or less. So that saves you a lot of time of, of experimenting, of shooting, erasing, shooting, erasing, when you get to imagine it right. So, and the next slide here is that the, mo the longer I've been shooting, the more I realized I needed to get out of photography to bring new thought in. Okay, so people could say, you know, just probably thinking out of the box. So, with that in mind, there is one last theory that I would like to share about uh, about cosplaying and how it uh, it translates to different mediums. Okay, so next slide. Beyond the shutter, it's about understanding the media that gave birth behind the costuming movement because cosplay photography is already a secondary interpretation of an original medium the fir the primary interpretation would be the you know cosplaying the live uh, the live version of the characters okay so you know digging a little bit deep i hope nobody gets uh, nobody hasn't gotten a nosebleed yet <laughs> all right i'm going to talk about um, marshall McLuhan. Okay, and in his famous lines called "The medium is the message." Okay, the message conveyed is altered by the medium it is carried in. So there is one message, but the way that we experience it through different media changes the way we 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 would perceive a message. One solid example is a a Mani Pacquiao fight. All right. So if you were in the provinces and you don't have any access to TV or even pay-per-view, you would tend to listen in on the radio and you would just listen to how a, the announcer will describe Manny's fight, right? So more or less you would just imagine it out of hearing it and that's what, uh, what radio is. Then the following day you would have people writing about it in print so you always know that the medium of print will come a day after because it's always done after an event not even during because because of the constraint of printing. TV, there is, an, uh, there is a bombardment of both visual and audio. And lastly, the internet gives us instantaneous feedback over and, ab uh, over and above just experiencing it. We can actually reply. Okay? So one medium after the other uh, tends to supersede or add stuff. 
Oh, okay. There's this nice question here. I've noticed much of your work is very illustrative in nature. Did you do uh, Did you do any readings, or recommend books in learning of sort of digital illustration? Um, yes, I will show you. Uh, I will show you later on how some of our images are made. I work with a team. All right, so I'm just uh, I'm just the photographer. All right, so I work with us uh, with friends who are art. Uh, uh, art directors, illustrators, production designers who, you know, we collaborate together to do something fun. And that's how the birth of our work came to be. So, one good example of a, of a title that has crossed into a lot of different mediums is Death Note. So, it started off as a manga, you see an anime, then there was a live action movie, and there was a cosplay shoot. All right. This cosplay image, by the way, was uh, is by Trisha Gosinkian, a famous uh, fashion blogger. All right. Now, what's the importance of knowing the different mediums? Okay, knowing the nuances of each medium empowers us to make the best out of the final output. So we know, for example, a comic book character being translated into a live medium of cosplay. So we know that some costume, some elements in the costume that can work in the comics may not work in real life. So you can imagine what if you actually convert or you know you translate the yellow spandex wolverine and you put him in real life. You know, realistically speaking, you would have a superhero sticking out like a sore thumb. All right? Hence there are some considerations in um, translating things. Um, like for example, uh, from a drawn medium to a live medium never mentions fabric. So we also have to take into uh, we have to take into consideration the kinds of fabric that were made or that's available to us and translating the costumes. How will it how will it fit? How will it bend to the model? So on and so forth. There are a lot of other elements. Okay. Now, I would uh, the next part is probably the types of cosplay we would see. This is by you know this is in not close to any uh, empirical data. All right. This is more or less based on an observation of the kinds of cosplay we get to see. Okay? So. There are basically three types that I have observed uh, over time. There is uh, what you call fashion-inspired, self-interpretation, and pre-existing characters. So three, more or less three different types. Okay. Let's wait for it to load. Okay, there you go. The first one we will talk about is called fashion inspired. Okay. Oh, there's a good question here. For you, a boy or girl to shoot cosplay, what which, which would I prefer? Okay. Um, you know, I'm my cosplay work is based on comic book characters. And uh, unfortunately, this is, I would have to say, guys have a double standard <laughs> to it. Because if you look at the archetypes of comic book characters um, uh, in the comics, it's either they're buffed and they're big. And they're pretty hard to find here. <laughs> okay. Uh, for example, I, 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 wanted to, I want to shoot, let's say, Colossus. Where would you find a huge Colossus here? <laughs> so... Girls are much easier, in a sense, to shoot that way because girls are very flexible, you know, makeup, styling, and all. Whereas guys, you know, <laughs> we're, you know, there, yeah, we can have a sexy colossus or a She-Hulk. There you go. Uh -huh. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Uh, okay, fashion-inspired cosplay is probably the loosest form of cosplay. Okay. Let's wait for it to load for everybody to see. There you go. Um, it's theme based. Uh, it's theme based rather than an actual character. So you will see French maids, girl school. Um, yes, yellow spandex Wolverine is Pinoy height. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question. You know, uh, if, is there any other cosplay shooter or photographer that you would look as inspiration? Uh, you know, I, I would actually look back to the masters, eh? the ones who have established not cosplay but fashion, portraiture, and glamour photography. Because 
they're my inspirations. If you're if we're gonna drop names, it will it would probably be Antoine Verglas, uh, Dave Hill, um, Annie Leibovitz, uh, David LaChapelle. Those guys are insane. And for me, I take a lot of my inspiration, you know, looking at their work. And not just photography. I read a lot of comics, and I attend a lot of comic book conventions more than you know photography conventions. <laughs> unfortunately, you'd see me more in because I'd like to. Um, I I'd like to I like to pick into artists' heads. Okay. Uh, so fashion inspired uh, cosplay is like dressing a subculture. Yes, you could say that. Yeah. And funny thing is, a lot of these border on casual Japanese street fashion. Okay. Who con uh, who conceptualizes the shoot and how many are working on a project? Um, you know, it's it's a small group of friends. I wouldn't exactly call it a panel, but we're you know we're we gather we gather over a few drinks and we just toss around characters to shoot and just imagine you know who could this be who could that be you know the same way we I thought of um, shooting Rogue for example it was you know we were just eating in some Chinese hole in the wall restaurant in San Juan <laughs> and uh, over dim sum we just imagined oh let's shoot Rogue because it so happens that you know we were watching. There was this old TV that was playing the 90s X-Men, you know, -na 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 -na, something like that. And then <laughs> we just thought, hey, why not Rogue? And it started from there. It can be as, uh, as you know, casual as that. Okay. The next type of uh, cosplay is what's called self-interpretation, which is not far from, you know, the first type, which is fashion-inspired. It is also a loose form of cosplaying, but there's a generically established character. There is an attribute with no strict design. Okay. Um, most uh, most likely are based on fictional groups or races. So you will have like Klingons. Okay. You can have dwarfs, Ghostbusters, and the latest trend among cosplayers, Vocaloids or, uh, yeah, Vocaloids. All right. As you can see, there is no specific character, but there is an attribute which automatically links them. Uh, which are like the oh, you know what? I actually have a Ghostbuster costume. <laughs> yes, because I'm fat and I'm gonna resemble like a Pinoy Ray stands. <laughs> and yes, I did have a proton pack made. <laughs> okay. Now, the more common notion of uh. Cosplay is what you call the pre-existing character. So there is a you you are adhering to a specific character design, and it's the most commonly practiced form of cosplay. Okay, the more faithful to the character's design, more or less, all right, more or less, the better recognition one gets. Well, popularity for a, uh, for a cosplayer. Okay. Now, one noted example, these are just images I saw online, and I was just researching about it. So this is one character called the Witch, it's the anime um, Witchblade. The real Ghostbusters, or yes, I'd uh, I would rather go for the classic Ghostbusters, because that's what I grew up with. Age check. Um... Oh, there's one question. Does wearing Lolita dresses for a cosplay consider... Uh, I was shooting a gothic before. You know, uh, that's a pretty much gray area simply because the Lolita is also considered a fashion statement. But if that Lolita outfit was inspired or designed from an anime character, then it becomes a cosplay. Uh, as, uh, as a cosplay, you know, uh, it can become a pre-existing uh, cosplay image. But, you know, it's a blurred line. There's again, there's it is hard to define it because it's a free flowing kind of thing as pop culture changes over the years. Okay. Okay. Now this is one solid example. This is a cosplayer from Russia, I think, who drew, uh, who dressed up as the Witchblade, and my God, she went out in public like that. Okay. Uh, another question: If you are doing a mashup, one mixes the archetypes. Well, as long as um, the attributes of each archetype are still outstanding and you'd know they were lifted or they were combined from two or more characters. As long as they are evident, a mashup can work. Okay. 
another example would be uh, this one. Uh, this is from the character League of Legends. Uh, the girl, uh, the character is named Ari, the nine-tailed fox. I think she was nine-tailed. There you go. Yeah, and uh, the girl on the right side is the cosplayer. Her name is Miyuko. She's been in Manila several times for uh, cosplay con uh, cosplay conventions as a guest. You know, I'd wish she would bring this costume because it looks pretty cute. Uh, it looks pretty cute on her. Uh, but that's the character on your left. Okay. And here's a pretty notable one. Uh, the next slide. We'll wait for it to load. A lot of cosplayers. Uh, Oh, okay. This here's an interesting question. Regarding your personal interpretation of a character, who who's to say it is wrong if that's your take on it? Okay. All right. Okay. Um this there's nobody really wrong or right about it, but it's all about connecting back to the archetype. I mean, what again, you know, there is a there's an extreme to things. If you put so much self-interpretation to it to the point that the audience does not make the connection who or what that character is, then you lost you you lost the communication then and there. As much as you would like to um, put self interpretation, you also have to balance it out to pay homage to the original character because you know that's what uh, that's what the cosplay shoot is for. Okay. Uh, um, I am a. Oh, here's another question. Would you like to photograph more? I am a comic book based uh, geek, so I would do a lot more comic book uh, characters. But of course, anime is a close second in video games, so I will always sneak in a character here, here and now and then from anime and video games. Okay. Now, coming back, this is one particular cosplayer whom I was, I was blown away by his costume. When I first saw the photograph, I thought he was a vinyl toy. And that's how. You know how how precise he was in dressing up as the Joker. He's he's an act, he's an Italian American actor in in L A. Anthony Messiano, and uh, I've seen him personally in in San Diego. And you know, I would love I would love to invite him for a shoot. And the way you see these photos, it's amazing. It it looks like a bust. Okay, um, I would answer one more question before we work uh, we go over the work portfolio. Um, Ah, but how do we know or gauge which portion of our character we can freely adjust? And we're, okay, you look at the archetype attributes. Like I said, what makes Batman Batman? You know, the logo, the cowl, the cape. Those are pretty. Those are elements that are pretty prominent about Batman. So if you take those, if you take those uh, elements out, it wouldn't be Batman. So there is no again it, the, it's hard to dictate what it should be and what should not be but uh uh it's it's all about that message or it's all about that reconnection to the archetype at the same time breathing your own uh life or your own uh understanding of the character but for me i will always link it back to particular elements uh that will remind me of the original archetype all right uh we we will go through the work portfolio so you can ask questions also here um how things were done let's wait for this one to load this is going to be pretty there you go oh this is where we're going to have a slow in the bandwidth because we're already loading images okay one of my favorite shots uh, over the years was this. This was my, this was done four years ago for Digital Photographer Philippines. Uh, it's my it's our crazy take on Alice in Wonderland. It was a time when the the Johnny Depp uh, Tim Burton um, version came out, and I wanted to pay I wanted to pay homage to it without having to directly copy. So if you notice, a lot of these. Um, um, a lot of a lot of the cosplay groups would shoot uh the, the the famous tea party scene but it so happens that you know i was watching the movie then afterwards you know at home i got to watch sin city and i was thinking why don't we make it into a more adult oriented uh <laughs> alice in wonderland yes she is actually the cheshire cat <laughs> okay um good question on the rights you know, for as long as you're doing it on a personal basis, 
uh, for a non-profit base, basis, you're pretty much in the clear. And for in and you know, in a sense, a lot of companies won't even touch that because it's free marketing for them. Eh? It's a way they know that their characters will last and endure over the years. Um, simply because you're doing it. It's free advertising for them. You know, the even they actually hire cosplayers now in the states to promote for them. And Marvel even has a costuming and cosplaying section in their website. And they recognize cosplayers who are pretty much outstanding in their Marvel character work. Okay. Um, yes, I am. I employ. Uh, I would want. I wouldn't want to say employ. I collaborate with an art director, and it's pretty much a dialogue between the team members. You know, there's no particular person. In charge in who dict it's not a, it's not exactly a dictatorship but more like a creative collaboration because we are all you know um, contributors into the piece okay now uh, the next piece the next piece is also one of my favorites it's Alodia's uh, white queen uh, sorry white queen sorry white phoenix uh, all of this was shot with photography all right the wings the stars, uh, those bright editing, it's always been Photoshop. <laughs> nothing more, nothing else. Um, how much I am just a photographer, all right? I do not, uh, I do, not uh, do the post-production. Like I said, we are all equal contributors, and as a photographer, my function is to simply shoot the elements the needed materials for my art director and digital imager to post uh, to put together so my job here is uh, I have to I have to make sure that the lighting is correct so when the art director shows me a peg or a compre for that matter we have to imagine we have to imagine how the lighting is and we have to break apart the elements and light them up as if we were lighting one image put together in, uh, good question. Somebody, how difficult? Yes, very uh, difficult. Uh, those were goose wings, actually. No chicken or no bird were harmed in the production of this image. I would like to put as a public disclaimer. We simply put the goose to sleep, <laughs> and then we spread the wings. Okay. Um, Wow, flooded with question. Okay, um, I did shooting Captain Barbell or Darna. I was the official photographer for Captain Barbell when it came out in GMA Seven. So yes, I have a have a, I've had an experience with uh <laughs> with Captain Barbell. Um, again, you know, copyright is all about making money off an image. Eh? But the thing is, you know, in our cosplay work, we don't earn out of this. And shooting cosplay is something we do for charity, actually. So the prints that we get to gain and the exhibits we do, we donate it to an orphanage. Uh, that's the, we donate it to cribs. So we um, we don't earn anything out of this. And copyright, in a sense, is you know uh, derived from the right to be able to earn money or to earn profits out of it. So in our case, we don't we don't uh, we don't earn. Unfortunately, I would like to show the, the the images in the the white phoenix, but we didn't prepare for that. There are just so many things here. But I would like to point out: we shot the rocks, we shot the sky, we shot her hair, we put a wig on a mop. Um, the stars were shot by puncturing uh, holes on uh, illustration board and shooting a flash behind it. You know, was Alodia on harness? No, she was. She was actually a gymnast slash cheerleader in high school, so she did have some good experience with backflips and cartwheels. We just put her on a trampoline with uh, crash pads on the side, <laughs> and she she did an awesome job, almost flipping backwards just for the shot. Okay. It depends uh, how many images in the total. Um, for this one, it depends. It depends. So for this one, Phoenix is one of the most complicated ones to do. And it took me almost two weeks to gather the elements because you can't, for example, the sky was shot after a storm. Okay, so it was sheer luck that you know I peeked out of the window, saw the sky, and went, "Oh my God, I have to shoot this." So I went, I went up to a near to a nearby hill and shot the sky. Boom, there it was. 
the model was shoot in a studio. Okay, let's move on. Next image. Oh, one of uh, one of the latest uh, ones we came out with. Let's wait for it to load. There you go. Um, Wonder Woman with Marion Rivera. <laughs> okay. Uh, like I said, you know, as, uh, cosplay is a personal. Uh, it's a creative out. It's a creative output. So we, uh, like I said, they were not. Uh, we're not earning anything out of it. Hence, you know, we didn't have to pay rights for something like this. And in in the, in, in the states, if I am not mistaken, I could be corrected for this, but a lot of sites are saying that cosplay is not a cop. Uh, it's not a copyright infringement. And you know, in a sense, coming back, comp uh, a lot of these comic book companies, you know, it would they would be put in a bad light if they would actually slam fan work like this because it's it's uh, it's a validation of their characters' anyway, um, success and popularity. Eh? So it's it, again, it becomes a very good conduit for them to sell more stuff. So it's counterproductive for them to actually clamp down on uh, on you know costuming in the costuming movement. All right. Yes, it is free promotion for them. Okay. For those who would want to see how um, some of the images are made, you can actually check out my blog, jtablante.com, and I actually exposed how these images were made and some of the um, elements and actually our creative processes of how we combine them together. So I would love to go through that, but that's going to take up too much of our time. So you guys could check out my blog for that. Uh, I did a past entry on um, on Psylocke. Okay. How do we plan it? We plan it like as if it was an ad campaign. All right. Since I came from an advertising, uh, I used to be an art director in an ad agency and still connected to the industry by photography. Um, that's how we approach it. There was this. There's even a complete deck. Of who the of who the costume maker is, what's the costume design, fitting, the corporate, all that. So we attack it like an ad campaign. So there is a sense of order out of all this creative mess, uh, so to speak. Photography gear. I'm not exactly gonna touch up on that because it really depends on what you're comfortable with. I'm not gonna say shoot with this camera, shoot with that camera, but I would suggest an SLR <laughs> or a DSLR for that matter. Uh, but Whatever brand or whatever model, I would leave it up to you. You know, to each his own in terms of uh, weapons, uh, weapon of choice. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's a nice uh, permission. Well, not exactly. You don't have to. You know, a lot of cosplayers in the states well, she would just shoot it, and it, they don't really need to ask. Uh, you don't really need to ask permission. And funny thing is, actually, I, uh, particularly with Marvel, Marvel is very supportive of the costuming movement. And what happened was uh, two to three years ago, I received email from them asking if they could actually feature some of our work in their website. So when you go to the Marvel website and uh, Google for some, uh, sorry, search for some of the characters, our images come up. Uh, so that's how supportive they are. Uh, in terms of the costuming movement, okay. Okay. Now, okay. There's another question here on uh, how much photoshopping happens. Okay. Uh, sure, there are a lot of uh, post-production that happens here simply because we are compositing a lot of shots. But to achieve the comic book or superhero feel, it's a combination between lighting and post-production. One cannot live without the other. Okay. So you can't. Over, you can't over rely on Photoshop because the, you know the idea is garbage in, garbage out. So if you have bad method, if you have bad material to start with, you will come up with a crappy image, no matter how good, uh, no matter how good your post production is, and vice versa. Um, okay, here's another interesting question. Um, uh, yes, I am planning to make more Phoenix shots. So I have a racial summers. Uh, Coming, it's already in post-production phase, and I will. I also have a Phoenix uh, Marvel Alliance version that I shot with Yaya Han uh, last year during San Diego Comic Con. Yes, uh, on f other photos, do you use CGI? You know, coming back to the idea that 
I am not a photographer anymore. I am an Imagineer. And all creative people are all Imagineers. And for me, I don't really care if people would say it's too much CG, too much like this. You know, I've come to the point that I just want to make my childhood images happen. You know, I'm just a fanboy. I just want to convert these things into real life. Okay? What local superhero you would like to shoot? Uh, you know what? I actually shot a Zaza Zatorna. <laughs> and that's going to come out pretty soon once we finish shooting the zombies. <laughs> and I've done local characters also. I have collaborated with uh, Budget Tan and Kajo uh, Baldesimo, and we did some shots of Trece. I would love to do that again because Trece, I think, is one solid local character whom we should actually export out of the Philippines and into other countries because she's, because she's awesome. All right, shameless plug to, to the guys, but Etres is an awesome book. Um, out of curiosity, if you if you don't make money out of this, how do you pay for the models? You know what? We don't. <laughs> you know, it's a collaborative thing. Uh, it's, it's it's a collaborative thing, and you know, it's for charity. And at the end of the day, we just want to come up with these images because we think it's cool, and it's just all about employing. You know, uh, tapping into the minds of all these other creative types who would want to contribute things for fun. Because I just do it for fun. Okay. I would like, uh, well, shameless, uh, let's say hi to Rach David. <laughs> yes, thank you for being such a big fan. <laughs> Okay. Um, now the next one is storm. All right. So we sh how how did we uh, how did we separate the elements? Um, we shot the tiara and the head separately. The body shot separately. The the hair was shot on the floor, sp uh, spreading the hair like that. The the cape was shot separately and the legs. Now. For the storm behind it, believe it or not, that's an actual prop. We actually got chicken wire, wrapped it around the coil, and placed a lot of cotton. Okay, we wrapped, we kept, so it's turned into a coil, so you can have this uh, tornado-looking shot. And we placed it on a scaffolding, and they shot it from the top. Okay. Um, question: Any plans of shifting to a different work uh, photography? You know. Uh, if you go to our, if you get to to go to my Facebook page, I have what you call an, an extreme portfolio. I will have something as crazy as cosplay shoots, and then I will have personal work that's just run with natural light. So it's an extreme, and I wouldn't say, uh, you know, I wouldn't say stay. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm going to be staying in uh, cosplay photography because you know you'll never know how things run. Uh, you know what? Uh, here's another. If you don't pay the models, how do you say? How do they say yes when you invite them for a shoot? You know, show them the idea. And you know, who doesn't want to be a superhero? <laughs> you know, uh, it's just a matter of showing the concept and you know, inviting people to it. If you were, if you're, you know, if you're able to show your your vision to it. People would climb on simply because it's fun. All right. Okay. Um, here's here's a good question. Uh, you know what? Okay. Yes. If I were to invite, if I were to make Joe Avila as a cosplay, I would shoot him as Gru <laughs> from Despicable Me. <laughs> okay. Now, um, the costumes. It's a mishmash of you know. Um, Finding things off the shelf, but in the case of Rian, this is uh, one of my favorite shots ever, and I was able to show this to Jim Lee in the San Diego Comic Con last year. And you know, being a big fan of Jim Lee, he he said, um, "I knew where you got this from. You got this from the Marvel card I drew back in the 90s." And from then, you know, that was for me. No, over, you know, that was the that was the fanboy. In me crying out loud, I'm like, oh my god! You know, he knew where my inspiration came from. 
And coming back to the costume, this is one of the most expensive costumes we spent on because it costs about 24,000 pesos. <laughs> it mainly went the boots because the boots is real leather. Uh, the bodysuit is made out of neoprene. Uh, well, speaking of sponsors, you know, the moment... Uh, no, it's not chopped off. It's if you notice, there is a small section there with her leg. It just so happens that the boots is very long. <laughs> okay, where do I get the money to pay for the costume? Well, I shoot advertising. That's my uh, bread and butter, you know. And I will always put like a five to ten percent uh, portion of my earnings and put it in what you call the cosplay fund, quote unquote. <laughs> and that's what we use to uh, to run our cosplay shoots. All right. Um, Wow. Uh, what happens to the costumes? They are in our stock room. So it, it, they, they become pretty popular during Halloween. <laughs> They're borrowed out. Um, the, here's another question. Do you think that the fact that you're a known photographer boosts the chances? I wouldn't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I just... There are some people whom, who don't know me at all, and I just, you know, I would say that, you know, for example, this model who was my Jubilee, um, I worked with her in an ad campaign, and she doesn't even know me from squat, you know, it, but she looked like Jubilee, and months after, I sought her out on Facebook, and I introduced myself and told her, hey, you look like a character whom I would like to shoot. Could you be my Jubilee? And I just, I was just that upfront with her. So... And she said, yes, you know, you'll never know. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing to lose when you ask, all right? It's just, you know, when you get turned down, it's just your pride that you, you, you would just swallow it. You know, what's that? Okay. Now, uh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, any plans of shooting DC characters from the Injustice game? Okay. This is how we actually select our characters because I wouldn't want to to just create a shoot do a cosplay shoot just because this character design is already popular. It it's it's hard to do that. Um, my personal preference is I always gun for characters that have been um, that have lasted a certain length of time. So when you know you know how strong their archetype is if they have survived decades or years of being, you know, if, and people are still fans of them. So you'd know when a character is worth to shoot. Because it's hard to shoot a character that, uh, you know, just came out yesterday or last week. Because not a lot of people know him or her yet. So you have to wait for a character to simmer into public knowledge before shooting it. I mean, that's just my personal uh, preference. Okay, so this, this next one was out of um, Final Fantasy. So this one, it's, this was my colla this was a collaboration with uh, uh, with my other sponsor, and uh, we shot this in the middle of Clark, in the Lahar area. <clears throat> Let's wait for the other one to load. Right. This is one image we recently released last week, and um, this is Mr. Freeze. One of the few times I was actually sh that I shot, I was able to shoot a guy. Um, uh, I shot this last year in Singapore during the uh, what's this? During the International Cosplay Day celebrations, and the cosplayer happens to be a, one of the costuming technicians in Universal Studios. Hence, he knew how to make his own stuff, and it, it looked pretty good. Um, how was this shot done? Um, the chair was made out of ice blocks. So we actually bought a huge chunk of ice from, from, a, from an ice factory, chopped it up, and shot it against a light blue background. Um, and then the spikes on the ice is made out of sugar, crystallized sugar. And uh, Nora Fries at the back, the one in the glass case, we shot that, and uh, I actually bought a beer tower. 
you know, and wrapped it with crystallized uh, with uh, with uh, crystallized sugar, and we shot Nora by jumping. She was just jumping, and she was shoot, uh, we were shooting her in midair. Um, the background, I shot it in an empty warehouse, and for the other elements, at the background, we shot um, in a factory and got those machinery. And in front, uh, the the snow that you see in front is actually alum, or you know, tawas. <laughs> okay. I don't actually mind shooting a lot more guy cosplay shoots, but it just so happens that casting for guy cosplay shoots is a double edge. Uh, it's, a, it's a double standard because uh, it's hard to find, you know, buff guys which will match the looks of Superman for that matter. <laughs> Average time for us to produce cosplay images is uh, two weeks. Two weeks up to one month, and that's bouncing back and forth between post-production, uh, sorry, pre-production, production, and post-production. Mr. Freeze looks like Joe Avila. <laughs> that takes the cake. We should have a special award for that. <laughs> Give him a prize. Give him a prize. Give him a jacket. <laughs> okay. This is um what. This one next is uh, Jinri, Jinri Park, uh, as Psylocke. This is our second, uh, what's it? This, is, this, is, this was our second attempt in shooting Psylocke. Um, what happened here is this, this set is actually a miniature. So what my, post, uh, my production designer did, we created a, a sandbox, a 5 by 8 feet sandbox, filled it up with uh, sand. And got those toys. The toys are from a Marvel, the Marvel Legends Sentinels. And uh, yeah, the guy I borrowed it from didn't know that we stuck it in sand. <laughs> so there. So we put it there. And in the background, the city, uh, the city of Genosha. Um, no, they're not real. Mad, they're CG. So I am. I, I got the help of a CG, uh, a CG artist who does interiors for um, for architecture firms. And you know, can you? Can you draw ruin? Uh, can you make you know renders of ruined cities in Mount? Okay, okay. Put it at the back, and we combined it with um, we combined it with our shots of dust, which is basically baby powder clapped in midair, and uh, and the set. We also yeah we also we also did the si uh, a silo with bubbles. That was but that was years ago, you know. Um, that's why I wanted to revisit a lot of concepts simply because we learned something new and we want to. Uh, revise it on a new character. You know, I'm actually just you know going through my folio, so this has actually becomes Q and A as well. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. This one is a. Uh, this is uh, Linda or Vampy Linda Le, and I shot this last year in during the San Diego Comic Con. This was an X Force uh, version of Psylocke. So what we did here is that we I shot her separately. I shot their hair, her hair separately. So in the original image, her hair was actually tied up to a bun. Why? Because hair is pretty much hard to control if you are trying to get all things to happen at the same time. And I also shot the sash separately. Um, as for the background, you know, there was a demolished building at the back of our house, you know. Um, so uh, at the back of our house and, you know, shot that empty lot. And then I shot walls of graffiti and put it together, you know, to the Psylocke. And if you notice the the side blade coming out or the smoke on the floor, it's uh, it's smoke from a mosquito coil and cigarettes shot against a black background. Okay. Next image. Uh, let's wait for it to load. One of the basic techniques to uh, in post production to make things cartoonized, uh, well, of course, would be high passing. But then there is a limit to that. Again, it's a combination between lighting and post production that puts it together, uh, which produces this um, drawn effect. Now, how do you do that? You look at read a lot of comics, uh, read a lot of comics, and look how the artists would actually draw light. If you would notice. It's 
it's even, but it's harsh. So when you look, uh, if you translate it into photography, you have to produce the same kind of light. How do you produce a harsh light, but at the same time spread out over the entire character? Things like that. Okay. Um, I would prefer to shoot it against white because a chroma green is only good for video. And it, uh, if you shoot a character against a green uh, background, more often than not, you will have a, a green cast. Okay. Yes, it is a bit odd. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that one out. Okay. Moving on. Next image. This was also a shot I did in uh, in calibration. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, in, sorry, in, in, in San Diego Comic Con uh, last year. So this was Red Sonia. Okay. Um, the background I shot it uh, three years ago when I was in the death in Death Valley shooting a wedding. Believe it or not, uh, I did a I shot a wedding in the middle of Death Valley, and after the ceremony there was still light around. I saw sand dunes and started shooting the sand dunes. Okay. Okay, uh, moving on. Next one, one of my or older works, Electra. Okay. You know, con a lot of our images is uh, has a lot of color into it, except for a few pieces. And uh, what happens is, um, part of my workflow is I actually calibrate my my monitor along with my art director just to make sure we are seeing the same colors, for example. Because uh, uh, what can be red to him is uh, pink to me. And it, ha and it happened, especially when, we're, especially when we're already printing some of our stuff. You know, it looked, it looked nice <laughs> on screen. Then it came out in print. Ay, 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 what happened here? As it turns out that the color space that we were using was beyond, for example, the gamut of the printer. So, you know, we were back in the drawing board uh, revising the colors again, things like that, okay? And next ones, uh, let's wait for it to load. Okay, uh, Miyuko, uh, well, I just asked her <laughs> and she was game. This one is a more. This was a little bit more extreme, more than just shooting. I want. I want. I was already diving into a little bit of. I was already diving into a little bit of artsy fartsy stuff. So I was looking, what if we make Catwoman into a into a watercolor painting? Most expensive shoot to date. Uh, very good question. My God, what was the uh, most expensive one? Um, let me see. I'm already imagining. I'm already looking to the past. Uh, hmm. It would still probably it would still probably be Rogue. Rogue takes the cake because of the costume. <laughs> this other one, uh, one of the obscure X-Men in the '80s, Dazzler. You know, uh, not a lot of people would actually know her, but. She was one character that hey, I wanted to do something. Just do the disco dazzler look, okay? Age check, yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, funny thing is, here's a here's a nice trivia about Dazzler. She was actually uh, she was actually a um, paid character. There was a there was a sound company I think that sponsored the creation of her character with Marvel. So they had to introduce a a, a mutant that had sound. That had to do with sound, so there, there was her power. Okay, so she converted sound to light, you know. But heck, some of a lot of people would say she was pretty lame, but they th but I think she's cool. Okay, the next one that's about to load is pretty familiar for some of us in the eighties, late eighties, early nineties, huh? 
<laughs> yeah, Joe is disclaiming that uh, he re and uh, he experienced he went he's he's familiar with this character. <laughs> All right, now now uh, Jessica, this this shot was uh, done in a set, so we did it all in one set. And then if you'd see the sparkles, the sparklers, how we did that is, you know those uh, bead walls, the shiny bead walls? Uh, you put them against some flash and you just make them spin around until you get that reflection happening, then shoot it, <laughs> right? Um, and then we got that element and put it, put it on top of us and overlay. Okay, loading up the next image. There you go. We have Sakura, one of my favorite characters in uh, Mar uh, Capcom. Uh, how do you calibrate the color of the digital ones to print? You know, yes, it is. You know, more or less, if you get to calibrate it correctly by using a spider, <laughs> then you know, uh, the margin of error narrows down to a certain field. So more or less, you know, uh, the margin of error gets smaller. So more often than not, we've I've done numerous uh, trials and errors w by traveling to Joe and printing with him that, you know, I was able to match my color settings correctly that I didn't need to even calibrate anything. You just send the file to Joe and he'll print it. <laughs> okay. The aura thing. Okay, here's uh, I calibrate my monitor actually every six months. But I know, yes, yeah, Joyce. Uh, once every two weeks. Yeah, Joyce is uh shaking his head once every two weeks. <laughs> but that's well, that's pretty extreme. <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, you know, I do it every six months. But I guess Joyce suggesting do it more often. And it's pretty quick. It's pretty quick, anyways. Um, it's a laptop each time they move. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the aura was okay. Here's the thing: you could actually buy small flash tubes, or uh, I call it the hockey puck light, and I and I bought it somewhere in Hidalgo, and it was just a small battery-operated light that's triggered uh, by other flashes around. So it's pretty small, and there's no control over it. There's no power setting. It just just fire the light wherever. So um, what I did was we we taped it inside the glove of Sakura. So uh, when the light fired, you know, it gave that glow on her hands and it was easy enough to replicate that effect by adding all things. So as long as there's a base element or base light to begin with, the rest of the effects is easier to it's easy to follow. Okay, how do you get your subject into character? Well, you know, that's where the book uh, in character, characters, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the acting book that I showed you guys a while ago. Because at the end of the day, you have, you know, you just, you just don't stand there and click. You have to talk to them. You have to explain what's in your head. You have to get them as excited as you are in producing, uh, in producing the image. And when you get them to enroll in that same kind of, train of thought you're in, you know, the characterization would come out. You know, it's you're a director and not just a photographer. You are a director. You're telling them how to emote because it's your idea to begin with. Um, what is the small light called? It's I, I actually don't know anymore. It's a pretty it's a pretty it's not a Morrison. Uh it's a small it's some it's a Chinese brand that I bought. It's pretty cute. And uh it looks uh, anyway, it looks like a hockey puck. <laughs> All right. Okay. This one, the next one is Shadow Cat. Uh, Lockheed, or the dragon at the back, was actually drawn by uh, an artist from Marvel, Carlo Pagulayan. He is the official artist for Hulk. And he happens to know CG. And uh, I asked, can you draw me a dragon? And I needed Lockheed. So he was saying, oh, in between his downtime, you know, doing covers for Marvel, he drew something. <laughs> it was pretty fun. Lens. Uh, I only have one workhorse lens for most of these shots, and it's my 24 to 70 f 
And yeah, it's not just for cosplay, but that's 90% of most of my work. Has there been a prenup? Yes, you know, I think there was a, a Star Wars themed, not just a prenup shoot, even wedding, I think. Self-portrait. Um, Ghostbusters, Ray stands because I'm fat. <laughs> By the way, um, uh, by the way, so I'm. This is already a combined uh, portfolio in Q and A section. So I'm just going through this, and you guys could ask uh, questions. Slimer's gonna be pretty hard. <laughs> you know, a cost. Well, one of my hanging. Uh, concept. So this is a question. Have you come across a cosplay photo that you want, wish you took? Um, some that somebody else have already taken. Yeah, actually, there are several work out there that I wish you know, I've done it. Um, I would love to do a Voltron, Princess Alora, you know, sitting on top of that blue lion with Castle Alfor at the background. Um, but okay. Um. Moving on, so the image that I have in front of is um, Sucker Punch. So this is Amber. All right, it's a real plane. Okay, I uh, I was able to shoot it in the Mojave Desert. So there was an airplane graveyard there showing off World War II airplanes. So this is actually a B-17, if I'm not mistaken. It's a B-17 uh, fuselage. Yes, uh, given that you have you encountered people who plagiarize, yes, some people uh, in the uh, there was a, one particular uh, photographer in the states who actually well plagiarized our background and replaced it with his own version of Phoenix. Uh, well, I did warn him warn him about it, and people did bombard him in Facebook saying that you know you you stole this image, and he eventually tore it down and uh, put it uh, you know took it down, and his excuse was it was just an experiment, but what the hell, right? You know. Um, okay. <laughs> Which? Okay. Um, dream project uh, as of today. You know, I would love to shoot Archie. The entire cast of Archie sitting in pop tates. That is my dream cosplay shoot. And that's going to be insane to light. Trying to light up all of those characters in, you know, it's a one one huge uh, diorama of sorts. Okay. It's you know what Josie and the Pussycats are even um uh, what two characters? Gem and the hologram. So that's another that's another chick uh, chick cartoon that you know that's uh, that's pretty cool to shoot. Okay. Well, of course, why do I use, someone, someone says, why do you spy? Because the colors are pretty accurate. You know, I've used another brand before and it blew off the magenta in my screen. So I couldn't put it back. And so far, I've been pretty happy with Spider because uh, uh, it was the closest one that, you know, that doesn't discolor my screen. <laughs> and the profile is made, you know, um, the colors are very accurate. Okay, moving on. What's my next image? Well, this is also from Sucker Punch. Uh, let's wait for it to load. All right. Um, the next one to load is uh, yes, Baby Doll. So this was the final Baby Doll costume in her uh, in the dream sequence. Uh, and we shot this. This is on set. Everything was done on set. So this nothing was added. You know, well, the only thing added in post was the cigarette smoke because I am asthmatic and I cannot. Uh, the moment I get to smell cigarettes, I start ca coughing. So yeah. So we added that in post. And plus, my model doesn't smoke. So even smoking a tobacco is going to be a big challenge for him. <laughs> Question here: Do you plan to do a Resident Evil? Yes. You know, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, Alodia gave me a call and wondered if, she, if we can if we can do an Ada Wong concept. But given how busy she is and she lives, you know, half the time in in Japan, we haven't gotten around to do it. All 
Okay. Uh, moving on. I'm just going over some, you know, past work and all. Um, Naruto or Dragon Ball? Hmm, uh, I'm I'm a fan of Dragon Ball, but I don't know. I would love. I would love to do that probably in the States or I would find a really buff dude, you know, like a, a Super Saiyan Goku already with a torn, with a torn uh, costume. Now that would be awesome. International cosplayers, Jessica Nigri, that's one. Uh, I've, I've got the chance to work with um, Yaya Han, uh, Linda Le and all. Uh, Jessica Nigri is in my bucket list for sure. <laughs> Um, are you are planning you to give a workshop, workshop here in Cebu? Cebu? I have actually given a workshop in Cebu, Cebu care of Canon. <laughs> uh, last October, I was there in SM uh, for two days in the weekend. Uh, live animal. A live animal is pretty difficult unless, you know, unless a character calls for it. Then we try to find one, but you know, getting a live animal in the set is pretty hard. Um, do you have a sample of a cosplay photo without photo manipulation? No, because you know, for me, I always love to. For me, I, I I like it when my photographs don't exactly look like images, and so it won't. I won't actually have an image without any. Uh, post-production work on it because I always want for me personally my cosplay shots I it's a homage to the original art form so as much as possible I like to bring it back to the original medium uh, trending and uh, with the trending anime characters again only time will tell just because um, attack on Titan is popular this year it's not necessary that people will still pick it up five years from now. So that's where I actually gauge, for me personally, which characters to do. Um, one of the characters that I really uh, that I've been wanting to do is, for example, um, Ghost in the Shell. But unfortunately, I could not find a major motoko. I wish I could find a major motoko. Um, There. Uh, let's go. Uh, this one's uh, again to talk about this image. I borrowed the Iron Man bust from Alodia. She has a one to one Iron Man bust in her room, as, as, uh, aside from just uh, the, uh, an Iron Man shrine. Yes, I am planning to go to San Diego Comic uh, San Diego this year. I've already uh, I've already booked my badge. <laughs> Star Wars. Um, I well, I'm a fan of Star Wars, but I'm not really. I haven't gotten around to imagine how I can give a good spin to it, given the fact that a lot of people have been doing Star Wars shoots. So I have shied away from Star Wars for a good number of time now. The other, uh, this one is a fam familiar character for those who are playing uh, Capcom video games. So this is a. Uh, what is um, this is Morgan from the Darkstalkers, one of my earlier collaborations with Carlo Pagulayan again, uh, with the artist uh, in from Marvel. He drew, he rendered the wings for me, all right. And he was using this software called ZBrush, the same software they used to render Iron Man. Okay, any other dark software character? I would love to shoot a Felicia. <laughs> For uh, this is a question who asked, um, where, well, the, yes, I shoot all the textures. I keep a bank of textures, so you'll never know. You know, uh, there was I was shooting for, I was shooting for Canon two weeks ago uh, with shooting uh, Joe and other uh, brand ambassadors for Pixma, and it just so happens that I saw a lot of bamboo. You know, so for me, hey, you'll never know when you'll need a bamboo background. So after shooting them in between takes, I was just walking around our location shooting a lot of greenery. So you'll never know when you'll need it. Mm. Um, okay, go to the venue. Like, for example, um, this shot of Morgan, this was done on set. 
my production designer created the scene. So in a sense, this is the location. It doesn't. We should. Um, our cosplay concepts are always dictated by the general idea. So when you know an idea, it, you know, it'll tell us whether or not a studio is needed or a set is needed or a location is needed. It all depends on that concept that you want to pull off. So uh, there's no surefire way of doing it. It all depends on your concept, on the initial idea. All right. Game of Thrones... Uh, oh, um, not necessarily because uh, Game of Thrones is already a live action thing. So, you know, I, I preferred pulling out characters from another medium instead. Um, what advice to newbie photographers of the genre trying to start out in you know what? Before you, you say that you're you want to shoot cosplay, be a photographer. Shoot everything. Shoot anything because every cosplay photograph will present a different challenge. You know, the character can mean uh, one certain one certain character will entail you to study more still life or more landscape, for example. You'll never know. So for me, uh, diversify yourself. You have to become um, a photographer first before you can say. Uh, you could say you know you'd want to shoot glamour, you want to shoot fashion, or you want to shoot cosplay. Okay. What about characters from Image Comics? Grifter would have been. Uh, Warblade would have been. Yeah. Um, there was an idea of actually shooting wet works. Spawn is difficult. <laughs> you, know, you know. Besides. besides uh, Besides, you know, there's no face. <laughs> we, could, we could have just gotten any guy with, you know, uh, with muscles and shot of a spawn. So, you know, I, I, I would want to see the model's face. <laughs> um, I, I just, there's another question. Uh, another, that you, most of your work is, uh, wait, oh, I, I lost. Uh, okay. You know, some, some images, I actually try to um, lift it off from notable scenes in a anime or movie. One good example um, is uh, my our work with Lin Min May in Macross. If you were a big fan of Macross, I chose the particular frame when we when she was about to sing and she was lifted out of the SDF one because that was the highlight of it all. When she started singing, the war ended. <laughs> so it's that. It's about picking up. Um, Notable scenes and injecting those Easter eggs that you know when you make the image, you know when when viewers see it, they know you're re a real fan of that particular work because you know the nuances of the character. Um, here's another that Dota in Warcraft characters. Unfortunately, I am the few. I'm not a fan of, of Warcraft, so I don't play it. So if I don't, if I'm not a personal fan of the franchise, it's very difficult for me to imagine it. So that's why I've shied away from those uh, from those characters. How many shots do you usually take for a single cost? It depends on the concept. You know, there are some shots that will only take one, five, or in the case of Phoenix, it was more than twenty. <laughs> you know, um, always the concept. The concept will dictate uh, how the eventual flow of the work is going to be. Um, I want to try to shoot cosplay and I'm super busy. Uh, you know what? Do not... Me, you know, I'm not exactly an advanced Photoshop user myself and I don't do much composition myself. It's all about teamwork. And my, F and my contribution to this is I'm, I'm the photographer. I'm just the photographer. I am part of the process. I am not the centerpiece of the effort. So my job as a photographer is light up the images, light up the images properly, light up the the elements properly, and collaborate with an art director and digital imager and form things together. It's all about collaboration. Um, will I use? Will I do Mortal Kombat? Good question. 
actually. Hey, that's actually a pretty interesting franchise to um, do. Oh, Domino. Yes, I have shot a Domino in New York Comic Con with Yaya Han. So, uh, too bad. I, I actually took it down from one of, one of, uh, one of my uh, folio photos here. But yes, I have shot a Domino. When when you shoot abroad, uh, do you shoot with a team? Um, that depends. It was uh, we were just lucky enough uh, that when when I when I attended New York Comic Con 2011, we had an art director, Rafi Tesoro, my production designer was there, and luckily enough, my makeup artist, my favorite makeup artist, Ara Fernando, was attending a wedding of her cousin in Philadelphia. So we just asked her to take a bus, go up to New York, and let's shoot. And there you have it. We had a team. And okay, um, Joe is giving me the signal. I only have one ask, uh, one last question to do. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I have done several for Street Fighter. As you've seen, I have already done a Sakura. All right. Uh, do you sometimes stop at the place in which you imagine the yes you know um, the, the Alice in Wonderland scene was inspired because that that was on location all right if we come back to uh, uh, to the Alice in Wonderland that was, that was done in one shot except for the cigarette smoke and the graffiti in the background but all the models were shot all at the same time Um, Filipino comics. I have shot Trece and Zaza Saturna. So you know, for those who are curious, you can go to my you can go to my site. You've seen you you will see several Trece layouts there. Um, no, I will not shoot hentai. <laughs> white Queen. Yes, I have shot a White Queen years ago, and I'm actually developing a new one now. So a new one will come out pretty soon. Uh, tips for directing a cosplayer you know what you, the character that you want to shoot must be close to you, you have to be a fan of that to know the nuances and when you know the nuances you want, to, you want that to come out from your model so you know it will come naturally if you know the character pretty well, you cannot just talk to a cosplayer and say oh let's just shoot this costume and you know see, what, see, see where it goes it doesn't exactly work that way you also, as a photographer, you have a concept, you have a direction in your head, and you have to explain that and share that with your model so you guys in the same, are on the same page. Um, uh, movie, video, sorry, that's, you know, I'll be stretching myself too thin. I'm already happy with taking pictures. <laughs> Tekken characters, I don't play Tekken that much, so... Yes, no, we still up there. Uh, we're going to other questions. Uh, Akuma, Akuma, yes, he would be interesting. And if I could actually find somebody or a guy who can resent, you know, who's buff enough and who can who have the cuts enough and who could look really mean enough to be Akuma, I would love to do that. Uh, as you guys could see, I'm very particular with the casting. I don't want to force uh, characters that uh, uh, you know models who are out of place into a character. I will always shoot uh, studio strobes. Okay, so you know, uh, hot. Uh, some uh, what's this? I would I would use speed lights if I have to, and I've done so in in, sh in my shoot in New York since I was limited in equipment. Uh, and didn't have access to much strobes, I used uh, speed lights. Okay? Well, if you want to shoot uh, some guy who's suggesting a La Blue Girl, yes, go ahead. I would love to see that. <laughs> All right? Oh, okay, okay. Joe is actually giving me a, uh, uh, what's this, a cutoff. So thank you so much, guys, for attending our webinar. So that's about it. <laughs> All right, so I will be shifting uh, the control now to to Joe Avila. All right, thank you so much, guys, for attending. And here we go. Who knows?
Hey guys, thank you very much for attending this webinar. I know we went on overtime and I thank everyone for your patience and we have a special deal. Basically, everyone who signed up for the webinar, we have your email in our database, we have you. So you can actually avail of a 30% discount of a Spider 4 Pro from Shuttermaster Pro. Uh, check out the URL here on this page. Okay, remember, if you join this webinar, we have a special offer for you. You can get a Spider 4 Pro at a 30% discount from Shutter Master Pro. So, you know, clap hands and everything. Um, guys, uh, if you need to get in touch with me, uh, you can go to my website. You can check out my Facebook page or follow me on Twitter. Also, I would like to announce that our next two webinars, uh, the upcoming speakers would be Borge Meneses. Borge will be talking about beauty photography. And we have Raymond Cruz who will, of course, talk about landscape photography. We will still announce the date, so please watch out for future announcements. And lastly, I would like to thank Data Color, okay? Great people in Data Color for making this possible. The first Data Color webinar that we hosted thank in the Philippines. Yes, thank you, Data Color. Yay! Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we had a great time. Please watch out for our next webinar. And always remember, you have a 30% discount. Okay, thanks, guys. Good night.